Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, has to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Right back toward the hole. How about in? That's the second eagle he's made it for this week. <laughs> 17 years later, Hal Sutton is the players' champion. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another uh, episode of Be the Right Club Today podcast. And uh, Chase, I'm excited about this one. We probably get this question or or this topic more so than any other thing outside of help me with my golf swing. You know, it's how how do we a take my range swing to the golf course. How did Hal Sutton perform at the highest level as many times as, as he or you did? Um, how do we how do we play golf with a let's say a proper mindset, a championship mindset, if you will? Um, this one's going to be this one's going to be interesting because you know there's there's not a a set way for each person to do it. We talked about this a little bit before. Well, you know, to me. You, where you are in your golf game is kind of like your fingerprint. There's something that's right for you, and it may not be exactly what the world says is right. So we're going to talk about a lot of things on here from, uh, first of all, really knowing your golf game. I mean, I don't think very few people that come in here actually intimately know their golf game. Yeah, They surfacely know their golf game. You know, people come in here and they give me – uh, we're giving them a lesson. I ask them how far they think they hit a certain club, and they give me the total yardage. I played the tour for 20-some-odd years and never knew what my total yardage was on anything because it wouldn't do me any good because each week the greens were hard, soft, whatever it was. Sure. The only yardage that was consistent, whether I was in Houston, Texas, or Tokyo, Japan, was my carry yardage. Yep. I could count on that. And, you know, that's the way you play golf, on the things you can count on. That's why an inventory of what you're doing right now is really important. I spent my life managing what I had, not what I wanted. When did you, great segue to the first question, when did you try to work on what you wanted? I always worked on what I wanted. Okay. But Was I, in the middle of the season too? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I not as hard as I did in the off season. But, you know, I was always trying to move the needle a little bit. Uh but I wasn't trying to change the color of the needle. Sure. And you know, and I had to make an you know evaluation for the week. You know, if I left, the, I made an evaluation daily. Yeah. You know, I'd go to the practice tee, and if I was hitting a nice soft cut with a driver, and I wanted to hit a draw, I didn't force a draw. I said, okay, today we're going to manage this cut. Yeah. I didn't have time to fix it. I was man, I was so bad at that. It was always the the feel or the shot that I was trying to hit. I tried to force it way too much, and when I was off, I was I was off. I couldn't. Tiger talking about his B game or C game like that was I was either A or or and Imani talked about this a couple weeks ago um, I was either A or D like yeah. there was no kind of man I managed it around I, I I wish I would have and I remember people telling me this but I I was too I was too stubborn well Dude. one of the the tournament that I always say the best I ever hit it was when I won at East Lake yeah. against VJ Singh in the playoff you know the week I, I I, we could have asked Tim about this on the last one of the podcasts we did with him. You know, I had dinner with Tim Fincham on Tuesday night before that, and he said, "How are you hitting it, Alan?" I said, "Terrible." I said, "I don't have a chance here this week," and I, that was on Tuesday night. 
that night laying in bed, I thought, you know what? I need to slow my legs down. So I started working on trying to keep the space between my thigh a little bit wider. Never played a practice round on Wednesday. And just all I did was work on that and my balance. Good footwork, which we work on a mm-hmm. lot in here. Mm-hmm. The best I ever hit it and won the tournament in a playoff. And if you'd asked me on Tuesday night, I'd have said, there was 30 guys in the tournament, and I was hoping I could finish 25th. <laughs> That's management. That's all it is. Did that happen a lot, or was that more of like a flash in the pan? Well, it happened a few times, not nearly as extreme as that. Yeah. You know, where it's just uh, I'm still working on trying to get better, trying to move the needle a little bit. But, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't trying to change, man. I was just trying to hit the ball solid and straight. Right. So the question that I get, obviously – I'm a little more on the technical side with the golf swing stuff, but the question I get a lot is, you know, I've been working with a student for, let's say, four or five lessons, and they're like, man, Chase, I'm hitting it a lot better. Hopefully, knock on wood, they're hitting it a lot better. And uh, and they say, but my scores, I'm still shooting similar scores. How do, what, do, what do I do? And I found myself, we we'll talk about this a little bit, but I found myself making kind of two different analogies. Um, the first analogy I, I find myself making is kind of on a, a more of on a micro level, you know, think of the old, the old archers back in the day. You know, you'd be at a carnival or some type of festival or something. You've got an archer and you've got a, a lady putting an apple on top of her head. And to me, that's how golf needs to be played. And what I mean by that is, you know, when the archer draws back, pulls the pulls the bow back, pulls the arrow back, he better not be thinking about her forehead, or he better not be thinking about what might happen if he misses. What's he thinking about? He's thinking about where he needs to aim to go to put that arrow right through the apple. And to me, you know, that's that's a great analogy for how do we perform on the golf course? How do we hit the golf ball when there's out of bounds left and trouble right? And we've, you know, again, I, I mentioned Monty. Monty talked about it with Tiger. Hook the first three tee shots, gets up on the fourth one, and there's out of bounds left and nothing right. And he hits a little soft cut down the out of bounds line and cuts it right back to the fairway. Like, to me, that's a complete archer, archer mindset, archer mentality versus, oh, my gosh, what happens if I miss this or what have I done in the past or any of that stuff? Thoughts? I think that describes perfectly <clears throat> the difference between an amateur and a tour player. You know, uh, a tour player, I spent most of my life working on a commitment for the shot. You know, I need to f- make a decision and then stay committed to that. You know, I, I talk about a lot to people about don't decommit. That can happen in the swing itself. Just that just one fleeting thought goes through your mind. It can happen in the transition, and you're done. It's just chance it's at, sheer that luck at that point. It's yeah. sheer luck at that point. Yeah. So the a amateur that's fleeting. It happens almost on a, a hole, every hole. A tour player, 75, 80, 90 percent of the time, he stays committed to whatever the decision he's trying to make. Uh, you'll see one get less committed with the putter sometimes. They stay more committed from tee to green than most amateur players. And, uh, you know, to me, commitment has as much to do with a finished result as a good golf swing does. Why do you think with putting? Is it because there's. There's a more definitive result, like or, you know, it's uh, almost here, it's almost. I, I have an exact answer for that. Yeah. The closer we get to the hole, the more exact the result has to be. Yeah. I mean, and every amateur out there, you feel it. You know, ten footer is easier than a four footer because you're not supposed to make all the ten footers, but you are supposed to make all the four footers. So the result, you know, you're you're only comfortable on a four footer if you make it. Yeah. You feel like you got to make an excuse for why you didn't make it. Right. Well, let me help you with this. They don't make all four footers out there either. Right. And you're never going to either. You know, we I caddied for you for two events a couple of years ago on the Champions Tour, and I I don't remember too many shots where I didn't feel like you were committed to it. Did, was this a learn? I mean, again, I've said it a hundred times on here. I mean, my my golf swing caused me problems, but my ability to to commit to the shot consistently over the course of a season is what I think kept me from having as much success as I could have. Do you feel like you were where what would you grade yourself on on your commitment level? Do you feel like you were is that one was that one of your strengths? Was it I, mean, I would say that was one of my strengths, but I will tell you the years that I had down it was one of my weaknesses. 
when I can easily look back and see that. Uh, now, there's a lot of reasons why a person is afraid to commit because yeah. they don't know where it's going. Sure. I mean, uh, so there is a balance act there where, you know, you've got to hit it a certain at a certain level before you can fully commit. Right. I mean, commit to what if you don't know what is? Yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's a huge question, too, because... You know, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is, is it a functional, let's say, golf swing issue, or is it a commitment issue? You know, like, are you good enough? We can go a lot of ways with this, but if you're a five handicap, do you hit it above a five handicap level or below a five handicap level? Are you a ten handicap when it comes to ball striking and you, you've got a short, really good short game and you manage everything else really well? Or are you a one or two handicap ball striker on the range and then you play to a ten on the golf course? Because if that's the case, then it's this mindset commitment management thing is huge for you. Versus if you're scoring out of five but hit it like a ten, then come on and get some golf lessons. Well, I mean, take an inventory of your game. And, you know, I've tweeted this out there many, many times. you got to be honest with yourself. You can lie to everybody else in the world, but if you want to get better, you have to be honest with yourself. Yep. And when I say take an inventory of your game, I mean analyze what you're good and what you're not good at. And and that's an inventory right there and if you know that specifically you can make decisions that you can commit to for instance you're on a par five you've got you know you hit your three wood 250 or 240 whatever it is and you've got 240 to the flag but if you miss it you put yourself in a really tough up and down and your short game's not really strong hey guess what we might want to lay this up a little i know you know we've had we've had scott on and, and scott fawcett a decade and obviously you know his his stuff says go for it you know all most of the time in that situation hit three wood as close to the green because you're better from 20 yards than than 75 or 100 but but there are some times where if your biggest weakness is one area Obviously, we want to improve that weakness, but while we're playing golf that day, there might be some some strategic avoidance. Exactly, and I want to make a point to that. Uh, you know, I, I really like a lot of stuff Scott talks about with decade, and I think it'll take an average player and make a much better player out of them. I do not think it'll take a good player and make a superstar out of them. And here's the reason why I think that because the superstar is aware of what the 15th club is. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I'm saying oh, when I sure. say that? His mind. His yeah. mind and his gut. Yep. There is, and, and, and where I differ, you know, sometimes he says if there's 60 yards out there of available places to play, yep. it's always a driver. Send it. Yep. It's a mathematical equation. Right. And I will tell you that a superstar is not following a mathematical equation. His eye is telling him what's out there and he either feels good about it or not good about it and he's going to make a commitment before he makes that shot if his eye won't allow him to make the commitment before that shot he will not hit that shot i don't care if there's 80 yards out there well and it's interesting you say that because i, I bet and this would be a, a good stat for them to start i don't know even know how they would research this but you you go back and find the places that certain guys played good at every year and you know the fairways might they might not be a great driver of the ball and the fairways might have been even tighter where they played really well at because it kind of fit their eye and they were comfortable with it so there's there's a level of comfortability that some guys have with these golf courses that might make some of the math i'm not going to say you can you can throw it out because i'm i'm a, da a data math guy but i also think it's not and, and colt colt nost and some of these guys have been have been going back and forth with scott on on twitter lately um and again we we're we're fans a decade for sure his stuff's awesome but they all, every good player that argues with Scott, they say it's not black as black and white as he sometimes makes it out to be. Well, that's what I'm really trying to say right here, and I'm it. It is for 99.9 percent .9 of the people listening to what we're talking about awesome. right here. Yeah. It's awesome for you. I again, let me. I'm not using the word superstar lightly here. Yeah. I'm talking about world class. If he's moving from really good or even great to world class. He's going to make some of the decisions that might not mathematically yeah. meet Scott's standards. Tiger hitting stinger two irons off tees and exactly and my point. What, whatever it is, yeah. exactly. So another, you know, we talked about the archer, kind of the archer mentality. Another one that another analogy I find myself making with with juniors, you know, get the the parents all the time saying, 
hey, you made triple on hole two. We got to get him to quit worrying about it on hole three, four, five, or whatever. We, we, we have to talk about the triple first and figure out why we made triple, but, but you get my point. So one of the, the analogies I keep making that I think is starting to resonate with some of the kids we work with is, is you've got to treat golf like a, let's say you're a scratch golfer. So you've got to, you've got to treat golf as a 72-question math test. Think of go back to the high school days. If you're a young young kiddo listening to this, think about think about the last time you took a math test. You treated the first question this with the exact same weight or importance as you treated the 50th, the 60th, the 70th question. You also didn't let the first question dictate what you did on the fourth question, or the fourth question dictate, and so on and so forth. Right. And I think it's a great analogy for how do we play golf? We play golf where the first swing on the first hole is just as important as the as the the ten footer for for birdie on eighteen. But as golfers, we definitely don't don't apply to that that idea all the time, right? Or don't don't adhere to that idea, because there's as we get closer to finishing, we get closer to the result. We start thinking about our score, or we get on question two or question two or question four, and we three putt or four putt or whatever it is, or hit it in the water, and we're we're allowing that miss or that result to change what we're trying to do on question 10 or 15 or 25. And the point is, is each question has a set of data points. It has a set of, of information. We process the information. It, we spit out a result that we have to then commit to and move on to the next one. And and so far, we've been talking about this for a couple weeks now, and it, and it seems to be resonating with some of the knuckle knuckleheaded kids that we, that we work with that are stubborn and don't want to listen. Well... You know, we could we could say this a million different ways. You know, Hogan said that the most important shot was the next shot you're about to play. Well, let's analyze that real quick. How can the the next shot be the most important shot that you're about to play if you're still thinking about the last shot? That's exactly right. So, Freddie, my caddy, my longtime caddy. You know, I had a deal with him. I put my hand on two clubs that gave him the right to tell me what he thought because I had not arrived at a decision that I could commit to. That's very important, that part right there. So he that was his key that Hal's undecided. And let's just say five or six iron is what I had my hand on. Well, he was going to favor one of those. And, you know, if I was certain, I'd put my hand while I was waiting on the other guy to play on one club and pull it out. So if he injected his opinion and I hit the shot good and he was wrong, let's say he wanted five and I thought I should hit a six, he talked me into the five and I hit it over the green. Now I've got a tough up and down because I'm over the green and guess who feels some responsibility to this? So we had a deal. I said, okay, Freddie, if you've talked me into something like that, you've got to take responsibility for it. And boy, that's a tough thing to do because, you know, no one wants to admit a mistake. And so there's a really good thing for you to think about right there. Admission of a mistake will allow you to move on. So when Freddie said, hey, boss, I'm sorry I talked you into that, uh, but we can get this up and down. We just released that last shot. The minute we did that, we just released the last shot, and the next shot became the most important shot. Now, if Freddie hadn't have done that, then I'm carrying this forward with me. I'm thinking a lot of things. I could be thinking, how you were so stupid. You didn't make the right decision. You knew it was a six iron, and you didn't do that. Or I could say, dang, why did I let Freddie talk me into that? Freddie, this is your fault. Have I even thought about the next shot yet? No. So we talk a lot about playing one shot at a time. That's a detailed way of thinking about it. That's the way you have to go to every shot, the next shot, completely with that in your past as best you can. You have to. You, we've talked a lot about don't let it. Don't let one decision snowball into an avalanche that costs you more and more strokes. And that's exactly what you're talking about. It reminds me of catting for you and Boca. You know, we shoot like even par one over the first round. We were one under, two under on the back. We start on the back. We're one under, two under going into ten. One under, I think we're going into ten. So we're even for the turn. No, we're we're two under going into ten. We're one under for the tournament. You hole out in the middle of the fairway for eagle on a par five. Hole out from one twenty or something, and we get to three under. And I remember 
we were in like 11th place. His first tournament back. You hadn't played in a, in a while. Yeah. We we're all fired up. And, and two's a pretty good little hole. I'll never forget this. Drove it right down the middle, and we had a back left pin. It's like 160, 155, 160 into the wind. And we'd been coming up short a little bit. Our yeah. miss had been short. And we knew, we talked about in the practice round, we, we both knew you cannot go long. Five feet past this pin is dead. Can't go long. And you're like, what do you think? I'm like, I think it's a perfect seven iron. And I mean, you hit it right on the button, right at the flag. And I remember in the air, I'm like, please be good, please be good, please be good. I think it might be long, please be good. Don't be long, please be good. <laughs> Lands about two feet past the pin, goes down the hill, and it's an impossible, like impossible chip. And I remember it was, you were like, did that go over? And I'm like, sheepishly saying "Mm -hmm, it did (laughs) it it did and and i remember walking up and i I think i probably told you i was sorry about seven times because we could have hit eight iron to the front edge of the green and made par there 99 out of 100 times and you just flagged it and i i look back and i'm like if there's i've caddied for i've caddied in multiple you know events like that but if there was one caddy and opportunity I could go back and change clubs because we were cruising, I think you ended up making a really good bogey. You might have made double, but you made a bo- you made something, bogey or double, and it just kind of deflated. It was just like it let the sails out. We were cruising right along, and it was like, oh, just don't do it. But sometimes sometimes golf gets you. Well, you know, that's where decade would have been better. You know, we were stepping on the gas at that point. We sure were. You, d- you had a shot in three or four You know, holes. I hadn't. I really hadn't played golf on the Champions Tour in a couple of years. Yeah. And you were excited to go out there with me, and I had had uh, several operations, and I wanted to prove that I could make a, some sort of comeback. Right. And, you know, we had some m- moving along there a little bit, had some momentum going our way, and we both All said, right. let's step on the gas. And, you know, Scott uh, would have said, no. Let's put it right here and 15, play the mathematical equation. Fifteen feet short and right. Yep. And that's one place he'd have been right, and we were wrong. And uh, you know, uh, golf's a hard game. Let me tell is. you right now, even for strong minds, it's a hard game. So one of the the lines that you've used and used recently with one of our mini tour players, um, good players, was griping about you know feeling like going into a tournament he knew he was going to have to shoot fifteen or twenty under, and you like really quick stopped him and. One of the lines I've I've got up here is you can't shoot sixty five on the first tee. What is it? What is it? You know, go into that a little bit. Well, you know, to me, the way you play good golf is you focus on the first shot. Just like Hogan said, the the next shot's the most important shot you're going to hit today. So we drive it down the middle of the fairway. We've got one shot played that's good. Let's string one more next yeah. to it. Let's don't string. 60 shots next yep. to it. Let's string one more good shot next to this one. And before you end up, you'll you'll see that you've strung quite a few together. That's the way you play good golf. You don't try to string a bunch of them all at one time together. You're not swinging for, you know, swinging for the fences and grand slams and hell marys every time. Well, I used to fish a lot, you know, and it, it, one time in my life I caught two fish on the same cast. <laughs> so, what's it going to be like for you to try to catch 18 on the same cast? You know, we're going to catch one so fish at a time. We're going to put one good swing on the next shot. Okay, so how Sutton as the player, or even if you were caddying, how do you get, one, you hit a bad shot in a tournament, and it, it mattered a little bit. It wasn't the last shot of the, of the tournament to win or lose, but it mattered. How is How did Hal Sutton determine the bad swing versus the bad, bad commitment, and how did you, did you react differently post-shot to either of those? Like if it was a bad swing, was it like crap? I gotta, I gotta really work on that. I mean, did you even, war- did you even think about it? Like, how do we? Because I think this, this bad swing versus commitment is such an important topic. Yeah, I think it is too. Um, bad swings usually produce similar results. You know, there's a pattern there. You know, one off didn't cause me to think bad swing. One, one off, one shot, one bad shot caused me to think commitment first you've mentioned yourself about your own game it caused you to think bad swing and i think you're either are out there are you swinging at it poorly are you not making a commitment and uh i think people have to evaluate that yeah um you know i i looked towards my commitment level every time and i think that's a good way to look because 
I can at least play golf that way. Yeah. If I'm thinking, man, that was a terrible swing, and what do I have to do? Do you know how many times I fix my golf swing in the middle of a round? <laughs> Not many. Let me help you with this. Not many times. Most people aren't successful at turning their golf game around when they're putting bad swings on it. Yeah, and I, I think you know it goes back to this idea when you're playing tournament golf or playing any kind of golf for a score, it's survival mode. Yeah. You know, and you can't band it. I mean, sometimes you can band aid your swing around and change your setup a little bit or do something that's worked in the past, find a little feel and go with it. But but most of the time, it's doing whatever you can to post a score you can, and it's got to be completely committed to the process process and not so worried about the outcome on each shot to do that it's just that simple so this is kind of funny and i think this applies right here you know trying to get in with a round you know byron nelson told me he said how if you get scared and things are a little bit difficult try to drive the ball in the ground right in front of you get on top of it and try to drive it in the ground right in front of you, you usually hit it pretty straight when you do that jackie burke on the other hand told me to swing for the clouds <laughs> Two exact opposite yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Now, do I think one of them is more right than the other? Not necessarily. I, I really don't. I think they figured out they had inventoried their game. Yeah. And they wanted whatever they inventoried for it to fit me. Yeah. And that's something that you and I work hard at is to make sure that we're trying to take an inventory of that person's game, not make what the last person we just talked to, yeah. this person, that's it right. fit them. Or what works for you or works for me. That, exactly. That was, when I first started teaching, that was the hardest thing for me to do. It's like, oh, I'm working on this. You're going you're gonna to work on this too. It's <laughs> like, that doesn't, that, that doesn't work. Um, you've mentioned, you know, management a bunch. Um, you know, and we, and we talked about a little bit earlier, managing what you have versus versus what you don't have. You know, when was that? When was there a time where you know, late in the round, say your your draw was working better than your fade? You were a better draw or iron player than you were than you were historically a fader. But you know, 18th hole, back right pin, and you're you know, are you gonna are you gonna try and curve it? Are you gonna still do do what you do? Like when is there a Green light, well, yellow uh, light, red light type stuff. So this is a, a really good example. Crooked stick, the year John Daly won. I finished like seventh or eighth in the tournament. I don't remember. What, I, whatever it was, I finished one shot better than whatever that would get me in the Masters. Okay. And I'm standing in the 18th hole. The pin is back right, and I'm hitting a draw perfectly. And... I've got to birdie 18 in order to get into the Masters the next year. And I'm thinking, mm. I'm not thinking about making money at this point. I'm thinking about getting in the Masters. And I'm saying, okay, I'm hitting a perfect draw, so that means I've got to aim it right of the flag out into the water, and I've got to draw it. And I can't pull it back into the middle of the green, so I've got to commit to the exact line that I'm looking at and believe that I'm fixing to hit the shot. And I hit it as pure as I could hit it, six feet from the hole and made the putt. Awesome. And, you know, to me, it, it's all about a complete evaluation of the situation. You know, that's the 72nd hole. I'm finishing. So whether I make double or I make birdie, is it's going to cost me several thousand dollars one way or the other and the money became insignificant because i wanted in the masters i wanted to go ahead and secure being in the masters yep. the next year so i forced the commitment there and i think the the important question would be if you would have screwed it up and fanned it in the water it's how you handle the next tournament how you hand like it was that okay i made a decision I, and i was i lived with the results and you could still be the normal committed house sutton the next round of golf you play the next tournament you play it's not a catastrophic event that we'll say 12 at augusta for for jordan spieth like not that that was a bad decision it maybe it was or he you know he, he got a, he got greedy and overcut it or whatever but like that obviously has haunted him and other players and so to me it's What's the plan of attack? I'm going to hit it here for this reason, and if 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 I take on more than I'm by math I'm supposed to, I can live with the results if I don't pull it off. 
Well, I was prepared to accept the results. Yeah. I mean, I knew that, hey, this is what I got to do to get into Masters. I'm no longer just trying to make money. If I was just trying to make money, I'm going to hit it over into the center of the green, yeah. which a lot of people play that way. Yeah. I can tell you they're not winning a lot of golf tournaments if they're playing that way. Yeah. And um, especially if it's on the last hole. And, you know, I, I was prepared if I had a, if I made a bad swing. Yep. Yeah. And honestly, that's the only way I wasn't going to hit that shot. I would have made a bad swing. So then I would have had to have said, okay, I made a bad swing. I didn't lack commitment. I had planned the shot out in my mind. I knew exactly what I was trying to do. Yeah. And I think this is where Scott's stuff is really good for those high school kids that are firing at every flag no matter what they see. I mean, there's there's a brilliance a decade for the guys that are that are making stupid bogeys and stupid doubles and stupid triples because they're taking on flags and they don't hit it as good as Hal Sutton does. I mean, let's just be real with that. That's that's pretty simple. That's where, you know, I had to give my dad credit. You know, he he watched me play a lot of golf and he was a big, uh, you know, all of our dads mm-hmm. were big influences in our life. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad used to tell me all the time, move the pin to where you need it to be visually mentally yeah. move the pin where you need it to be yeah. and don't look back up at the pin when you make your final look look back at to where you moved it to because your final look is your bullseye and i hope y'all are hearing what i'm just said right there your final look is your bullseye i see these people do this all the time with putting and everything else they'll read the putt they'll get set up to the line and their final look they look at the hole yeah they didn't look at their where their bullseye is at yeah. and let me tell you that is not committed to anything <laughs> yeah be the go back to being the archer and looking at the lady's nose versus the right, apple exactly. right, at, right at the last second. Exactly. This goes back to a story we told on one of the first couple podcasts we did. But uh, Mike Small, the head coach at Illinois, would play play qualifying rounds and practice rounds with the with the guys at the at the at their home course, and he take the flags out. And the scores were lower with the flag out, and they hold out more with the flag out than when the flag was in. <laughs> it just shows. And again, that kind of goes back to decade. Like it just shows that. Even those are, you know, those kids are some of the best college kids in the country, and it, it, golf is hard. It's hard to hit it exactly where you're looking, looking every time. Yeah. Um. One of the things I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, was instant, instant gratification. We we've written down instant gratification is bad for golf. Think about what you see here from an instructional standpoint, like how one really, really good swing one really 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 bad swing can lead people down a path that oh i'm chasing this feel or i'm chasing chasing this thought what are your what are your thoughts well you know (laughs) i used to be this way and i see a lot of people this way right now one bad shot says what's wrong and you know i i try not to make any drastic moves off of one bad shot. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking for a pattern of things yeah. that are going wrong. And, um, you know, this game, I don't know how many times on this one particular con- uh, podcast that we've said this game is hard. Yeah. But, I mean, this game is so hard. And if you're not going to uh, loosen up a little bit on yourself and stop judging yourself so hard, you know, you're – you know, like we're saying, we're trying to string one good shot next to one good shot. Let's be a little bit uh, easier on ourselves and not uh, let's let's string some bad shots together before we jump to a conclusion. Yeah, right. And that's where four or five hooks in a row, three or four hooks in a row. It's like, okay, we got a we got a swing, some some type of swing issue. We're gonna have to figure out a way to open the face. We've also talked a lot about running your golf game as a if you were you know you said the CEO of your golf game running your golf game as a business and I think this is this is important because you know as biz, businessmen tend to be I mean obviously you know we we're running a business here but businessmen tend to not panic and be a little bit more uh, patient with with their business and and the direction their business is going They're, they build up their business but then they get on the golf course and it's just panic 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 and they they try and make so many quick rash decisions and it's like hey guys just just chill out and treat this the exact same way you would operate your business yeah well i never did as good with a short-term goal as i did with a long-term goal and you know uh 
I don't know how people in today's world run a business without data. Most people don't run a business yeah. without data. Right. And, you know, I always considered my golf game a business. So, you know, I didn't have data. I didn't have track, man. I didn't have this kind of uh, video ability. And so I had to really take an inventory of results. Yeah. I had to do it a lot like Decade does it. I had to go back and evaluate the round. How many pulls did I hit? How many pushes did I have? How many absolute push draws did I have? How many pull hooks did I have? Yeah. And was I missing all the greens to the right? Was I missing all the greens to the left? Very seldom. I mean, I, I didn't hit it over many greens, so yeah. that was never an issue. Short was an issue. Short is a big issue with everybody that's listening to this right, right now. Right. I will guarantee you that there's more issues with short than there is anything else. Yeah. And so those... I had to be the CEO. I had to take an honest evaluation of the data that I had available. Yeah. And then I had to make decisions off of that. You know, and, and then if I allowed someone else to make a decision in my game, I had to be sh sure, convinced that they could earn my trust, yeah. that I needed to listen to them. You know, trust is a big thing in the game of golf. We haven't used that word much, but you have to trust what you're about to do. You have to trust the, the decision that you've made. You have to trust the people that are advising you so that when you get there, you can commit to something. Yeah. yeah. Trust the changes you're making in your golf swing. Trust the target you picked. Trust the, the, the distance. Trust the line, the wind. The lie, the club. I mean, there's there's a million things. Yeah, there is. And if you're going out there not trusting anything, let me tell you what you can expect. So, not the results you want. So my dad always say, trust your swing, trust your swing, trust your swing, swing, <laughs> swing. Um, how did, from the time, you, let's say pre-shot routine was great, you picked a precise target, you're, you're set on the number, blah, blah, blah. The minute you got over the shot, from takeaway to impact, post-impact, how did you... How did you trust it? How did you commit to it? Well, you said yourself you couldn't believe how fast I made a decision and how quickly I executed. Yeah, you were when I caddy for you were really fast. And I was known as one of the faster players. And the reason that that's really big to me is because the longer you take, the more apt there is for a negative thought to enter your mind. And the minute that negative thought enters your mind, your level of commitment has gone down and it's been challenged and i was big once i made a decision let's get it done right now we've we've committed to this we're fixing to do it and when i see you know we go out i do some playing lessons with some of the kids here and one of the first things i do is pull my phone out put the stopwatch on and i start timing them and you know i've got we had some kids that take two two and a half minutes I, the shot's gone in 35 seconds or less with me you know, from the time the bag is set down, I've got my yardage. And when it's my turn to hit the shot, less than 35 seconds, the shot is gone. And we're fixing to find out if it's going to be good. When you take two minutes, you're taking too many inventories. That's all I can say. Yeah, there's just too much going on. From the, from the time, talk a little bit about from the time you set your club down to, again, to impact, or the time you take it back to impact, where's your focus? Where's your attention? Is it on target? Is it on swing thought? Is it on a, a swing feel? Like where, where are we at? Well, when I make my practice swing, it's on feel. The minute I set the club down and I move into the ball and I take my last look, my mind's eyes on the target, wherever I picked. If I move the pin, then it's on that. Okay. And remember I just told you all, make sure you your last look is wherever you intend to aim the ball. may not be at the flag. Do not look at the flag. If you're not aiming at it, do not look at it again. And most of y'all aim at way too many flags. Let's yeah. just, let, for, let's just, let's just be honest, yeah. yeah. Um, did you, any swing? Did you ever have – I mean, you've talked about swing thoughts, but how did you How did you handle that? Because you talked at Eastlake, knees spreading apart a little bit, but then – Yeah, but I didn't think about it when I was playing. I did all that in the practice. Okay, so would you, in a pre-shot routine, would you feel a little bit of legs separating, kind of slower hips, and then, okay, now get now, Yeah, now get in, in my practice swing, I would feel that. But when I got over it, I never thought about it again. It was all that. more of a target or a, or a, a, it was, a it flight was, or a... It was how I saw the shot. Okay. So I talk about mind's eye a lot of time. You know, 
you know, your mind's eye, whether I'm looking here or I'm looking out there, my mind's eye still sees what I wanted to do. Yeah. I never tried to let my mind's eye not see that. Um, we talk a lot about sticking to the process, sticking to the process, and, and you know, not allowing golf to make us panic and make too many rash decisions. And this could be from on the golf course to even long-term golf swing stuff. Like, again, I, I've... I've conveyed this a bunch. I struggled with pain. Like my my dad and I were quick to run to instructors when I was bad. When I had when if I didn't win every tournament, thought we were doing something wrong. Um, did you? How do you feel like you handled? You know this idea of no panic. Were you were you good at it? Were you? Was there times where you had to quit? You know when you were struggling in in the you know the early nineties. Did you did you run to? Did you start feeling like you were panicking? So let me be as clear as I know how to be. This was a tweet this last week is kids don't know fear until someone tells us we should fear something. And kids don't know panic until someone has told us we need to be panicked about it. Or you felt somebody else's panic about this. I felt my dad's panic about my game long before I was panicked about it. Now, there is a balance between that. He was too quick and I was probably too late. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, I'm a little bit more of the mindset that, you know, what's going to happen is supposed to happen if you've got the right people around you. Uh, you know, I don't think we should panic. I don't think we should push the accelerator, nor do I think we should hit the brake. I think we should drive the car. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's just how I feel like life should be. You know, um, there's many things along the way that cause us to question and, uh, you know, I, I'm better if I'm looking in the windshield instead of in the rear view mirror. Yeah. That's the best way I can. I mean, I can make what's going to happen better if I'm looking at what's out there yeah. instead of what just happened. How do you, if, if we could leave everybody with a... A quick little two or three or four step guide to improving their their mindset on the golf course. You know, one of the things that you you mentioned and I th- and we talked about a little bit that I think is really good is this idea of like figure out where you're at. So everybody talks about handicap. Figure out where your handicap level is, and then do you hit it better or worse than that? So taking inventory of your game, do you mm-hmm. hit it better? If you're five handicap, do you hit it better than that? Okay. If you hit it better than that, then we got to work on course management. We got to work on making sure we're committed to shots, the mindset, all, all that, all that stuff. If you're a five and you get up and down from a trash can, then obviously you need some swing lessons. But take the guy that's the five, the five handicap, but he he hits it like a one or a two or a, or a scratch. How does he practice his mindset? How do we go about improving improving mindset? Well, I think uh, first thing is you got to figure out: Are you making good decisions on the golf course? Okay, so good targets, good course management. Exactly. Stuff. Start, start with course management. I like that. Yeah. So I think uh, you know if you're a five, if you hit it like you're a scratch handicapper and you're a five handicap, you've got to decide: Are my target lines correct? Okay. And you know that's what decade does. That's what he talks about all the time. We short sighting ourselves too much. We we going after too many stupid pins. Yeah. Are we too conservative off the off the tee? Uh, lots of lots of things there. Yeah. Lots of things there. Um, and then, you know, it could be that you're just not a very good chipper. You know, and you're the few greens you are missing. Um, you don't have the next shot okay and if that's the case you need to figure that out now this is where i'm going to throw something else in and i've talked a lot about this is you know i've not seen many people i'm not going to say that it hasn't happened but i've seen very few people that turn their weakness into a strength i have talked about this i've seen people that have tried to do that and their strength ceased to become their strength because they quit working at it. So here's a very good point. If that happens to be you, you're out there and your chipping is not nearly as good, this could be the case because there's chipping epidemic going on right now. You can't take away from your strength, the practice of your strength, in order to make your weakness stronger. You have to add time to your practice habits in order to make your weakness stronger. Don't forget your strength. Yeah. 
and for those of you <laughs> we got into a couple of arguments on this a couple couple months ago but like take dustin johnson for example dustin johnson's been a great driver of the ball ever since he's come out right yeah. and he was just like tiger when tiger first first started wasn't the best wedge player Dustin Johnson has worked really hard on his wedges and become proficient at wedges in comparison to the tour to a tour average. But he's still not the best wedge player in the world. He's yeah. still one of the best drivers of the world, and he gets his he gains the most strokes based off of hitting driver off the tee, and he drives it so well. Now he's a proficient wedge player, and that's why he's gone from sixth to tenth in the world to one or two for a long time. But to your point, and I, I do I do agree with it for the most part. Like he's not. Brad Faxner or Seve with his, with wedges around the greens. He's just not. Well, so that's no discredit to him. Yeah. He's improved He's his weakness a lot. He's made him better. He, it's yeah. no longer a weakness. Yeah. It's not as strong as his strength. Yeah. But that's he improved it, and that's why he got better. Yeah. So let's go back to the five handicap, and and let's just say it's not. He's he's at a one or two. He's he's at. It, he has a scoring deficiency. Let's just say. Let's okay. just say, the stats. We we run all the numbers. We do it. We do combines. We do assessments. He's a good ball striker, pretty good putting, pretty good short game. His his weakness is a five or six handicap max. So he should be scoring better than than he's scoring. So we identify it's complete a complete mindset thing. How do how does he practice it? In your mind. In my mind, I think he's just got to make. He's, that's a commitment problem. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, at that point, he's just got to see the shot and hit the shot, be committed to the shot. And uh, I had a sports psychologist tell me one time, he said, Chase, you're, you're not allowed to flinch. The brain can't, he called them brain flinches. He didn't say, you know, you're a yippie or anything. He said, just, you're not allowed to have any flinches. And to me, that's what I would push the, push a guy like that to do. It's like, go to the hardest, hardest hole in your golf course or the hardest shot in your golf course and start working through, here's the shot I see, here's what I'm trying to do. Did you completely commit to it? Was your brain locked into, if you're visual, you're going to see the shot. If you're, you know, some players play with a little one swing thought, something really simple, like, are you a swing thought guy? Do you have a song in your head? What is it? Can you say from the time you took it back to the finish, your brain was locked in on that one thing? Well, I like that. Every one of y'all have played with a guy that no matter what's fixing to happen, he sees it in the air, he sees something bad happen. You know, before it's ever hit the ground, he's expecting the bad bounce, you know, and then he'll voice it after that. Why would I ever expect anything different than that? I knew I was going to get that bad bounce or whatever. And then you see someone that it seems like every time they have a chance to have a good break, they hit it in the woods, it spits it out towards the grain instead of back at them in the fairway. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, I never planned on anything. I never saw it happen. I let it unfold. And then I accepted whatever happened. You know, that's hard. That's really hard to do. That was something I had to work really hard at. And I never felt like I got completely efficient at it. But it was always something that I was trying to, you know, never to allow myself to get down. Never to allow myself to expect anything other than to stay committed to whatever I was trying to do. Yeah, and basically you're, we're going back to the, the math test analogy. You're staying completely present in your moment, in, in, in moment in time, and you're not – you might be three or four under with two or three holes to play, and you're not thinking, man, if I birdie out, I shoot this number, or I do this, or I do that. So here's a great example of the year I won Muirfield uh, Memorial, Nicholas's tournament. I got a three-shot lead going into 18, three wood off the tee for me, and I come off the three wood and hit it in the bunker. I got a three shot lead and I get in there and I got a pretty tough shot. I got to get it up pretty quick. I don't get it up quick enough. It hits a lip and comes back in the bunker. Ugh. And at the time I had a different caddy and Gino said, get out of the bunker, put the club back in the bunker and let's start this process over again. So I did come out of the bunker, put the club back in the bunker. He cleaned it, put, I put it back in the bag and then the whole process started again. The main thing that I did there was I put that shot behind me, regrouped, and said, let's start over. Let's do this again. Hit the next shot on the green 20 feet, made the putt for par, which was like not expected at all, and ended up winning by three. Yeah, that just makes me think, I mean, if that's one of our, our stubborn high school kids, 
they're going to they're going to take four seconds and rip the, rip that ball again, and either they they pull it off and it works out okay, or they hit it in the they hit it in the lip and it comes back again. Now they're now they're looking to double or triple or quad right in the right in the face. Right. They make they make triple or quad, and then guess what? We're getting a phone call the next day from mommy and daddy, and and we're gonna we're gonna hear about it, and we're gonna have to talk them through it. Yeah. Versus. Hey, don't let this, don't let one bad thin shot or a couple thin shots, let's say, came off three wood and then came off the iron. Don't let this thing snowball into this avalanche that can, that could end up being a, it could have ended up being a career altering mistake. Could have been because I could have blown a three shot lead on the very last hole and turned something that was going to be really good into something really bad. And, you know, that's a great example of don't panic take your time you can make this work and you know that's where trusted people my caddy at the time he injected when he needed to inject take your time yep. and uh you know sometimes we don't have caddies y'all are out there you don't have a caddy so you got to do that yourself that's right and and i think i think the one thing that we're going to keep talking about on this this podcast going forward is just the importance i mean look i'm a i'm a swing coach i love i mean i played at a high level and can 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 do the performance side too and do it we do it all here but you know i i love to get golf nerdy and get into the golf swing stuff but like to me this i mean what's our goal in playing golf there's there's some some of you out there that love to sit on the range and tinker with your golf swing and hit golf balls that's completely fine like i love nerding out in the, in the lab with you guys and and figuring out golf swing but if your goal is to shoot the lowest score you can every time you tee it up you have got to do some of the things and look into some of these things and I think making an assessment of your game is so important and then assessing each shot is so important. Was it a commitment issue? Was it a golf swing issue? What's your strengths? What's your weaknesses? Do you have, because I've had good players, I've had three or four handicaps say, Chase, what's commitment? Like, what does that even mean? And it's like, okay, wait a minute. we well, got to slow this thing down and really dive in because a lot of people just think the, that the brain doesn't even play a role in this, this crazy game and it plays a humongous role. And so... I think if you're out there, you know, you're a tournament golfer that's that's playing in, in, in some of these events and not shooting the scores you, you think you should shoot, you got to really take a look at a lot of this mindset stuff because it's so, 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 so important. And we're going to have sports psychologists on. We're going to have all kinds of people on talking about this very subject because of, because of its importance. Well, I can tell you right now, for each and every person out there listening, you, your mindset is as much a problem as your golf swing yeah i'm just going to put it that bluntly to you i promise you there is room for improvement in your mindset if you started treating it as professionally as you could and you broke the process down and said i'm going to live by i'm going to hit it within 35 seconds i'm not going to think anything but what my mind's eye says i'm never going to look at the flag i'm going to look at my target where and the flag might be your target but if you did all of these things this process and you stuck to the process, you're going to become a better player. I promise you. That's exactly right. And when you hit bad shots, you can almost breathe a sigh of relief like, hey, I committed to it. I just made a bad golf swing. Golf right. swings happen. Like, that that stuff happens. But if if you're teetering on both sides and you're making uncommitted bad golf swings and uncommitted good golf swings, we don't ever have a, we don't ever have a target. We don't ever have a plan to work through it. That should be the closing point right there. Because here's the truth. If you learn what true commitment means and you can stick to that, then we can narrow it down to it is your golf swing. But if you don't do that, we don't know if it was your golf swing or your lack of commitment. Amen. Amen. Again, as you can tell, I mean, this this topic is is one that we've we've been getting questions on and getting asked asked to do this quite a bit. It was one we wanted to we wanted to drive some points home and we hope that you guys have five or six things that you can take away from this obviously you know somebody like Hal that played at the level he did and i've i've been one of the one of the many things he's helped me on is is this particular subject because it made me realize how lack how, how my commitment lacked so much when i was younger because you can you can hear it in his voice how committed he is to what he's trying to do and and i think obviously to get to hear your you know almost to to hear your vulnerability like you know you've opened up in a way that uh, that a lot of people don't you know don't get access to somebody at your level and i think it's awesome because i do think one of your 
being around you as much as I have, one of your biggest strengths was your ability to commit to the golf shot, your ability to commit to anything. And, and it's this is good for business, this is good for life, This is and it's obviously awesome for golf. Well, you know, I, again, I mentioned my dad earlier. I mean, I'd never seen anybody that was as committed to what he thought was right as he was. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to take that same level of commitment into whatever I was trying to do, you know. And, and I'm not going to spend any time worrying about spilt milk back here. I'm going to keep going forward. I'm going to keep striving for that long-term goal that I'm trying to reach. I'm going to constantly take an inventory of, are we getting there? Yes. Are we stringing one good shot next to the next good shot? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's the only way I know how to live. And, you know, I am passionate about it. I, I, you know, I've made lots of mistakes in my life. And I'm 63 years old. And, you know, the truth of the matter is all I have left is to be able to give my vulnerability and my knowledge to you. And that's all I'm really trying to do. I am passionate about it. Sometimes it comes out. I'm sorry, but uh, it's just who I am. And, uh, you know, maybe that's why I played golf the way I did. I was pretty passionate well, about it. Well, it's awesome. So, again, one you said one step at a time. One step at a time, one shot at a time, one hole at a time. Don't allow your mind to get ahead. Don't allow your mind to stay in the past, and you'll play better golf. As always, thanks. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for listening. Let us know what you think. We'll see you next time. Look forward to it. Be the right club today. Yes!